Okay, so welcome everyone to the Systemic Agility Community Meetup Group, where I'm very happy to be welcoming Beata Boxness. Uh, Beata is a popular international business speaker and beyond budgeting coach. He's a uh, has a long international career in finance and HR and is uh, probably needs no introduction, but he's a pioneer in the beyond budgeting movement uh, and has written um, uh, the book Beyond Budgeting, a guide to more adaptive and human organizations, which is just out. Uh, he's a winner of the Harvard Business Review McKinsey Management Innovation Award uh, and uh, the uh, earlier book, Implementing Beyond Budgeting, Unlocking the Performance Potential. And uh, he's here to uh, talk to us about agile transformation and the elephant in the room. I'm sure we can, most of us, guess something mm -hmm. about what that elephant is, but uh, looking forward to hearing more from Beata. So welcome, Beata, and uh, over to you. And just so you know, uh, feel free, everyone, to leave comments, questions in the chat as we go along, uh, and hopefully we'll have some time, uh, Beata will give us some time to answer some or most of those questions. So over to you, Beata. Thank you, Ryan, and uh, hi, everybody. Um, I've been looking forward to, to this. Douglas Adams, the author. He once wrote that uh, I may not have gone where I intended to go, but I think I ended up where I needed to be. And I'm sharing those words because that's basically the story of my life, uh, because it was in no way given that I should be here with you today and talk about Beyond Budgeting, given where my career started. Um, I've got a business education and my first management, my first management job in a company called Statoil, now called Equinor, was actually head of the corporate uh, budget uh, department. So um, uh, I know what I'm talking about when I'm criticizing this this process and so much more, but uh, that's where it all started out. And through some coincidences and some great opportunities, I got the the chance to head up. Um, uh, large uh, beyond budgeting implementation projects in uh, big European companies, including Equinor, um, where we started out back in 2005, actually. And uh, uh, two years ago, I made a very difficult decision of leaving uh, that great company, Equinor, um, in order to be able to work full time with beyond budgeting. So that's why I'm here. And uh, let me share my slides uh, with you. So um, what we are going to talk about today is um, first the case for change. What's the problem? Not just with budgeting, but with traditional management or which budgeting is a part. So that's the bad news. We all know that there are problems, but maybe these problems are even bigger, even more serious and even more systemic than what we sometimes think. The good news, there are ways of this, out of this, beyond budgeting. Um, a somewhat misleading name because as you might may know or will find out, beyond budgeting is about so much more than budgets. This is business agility in practice. So I'm gonna talk about the model, uh, some fascinating cases before I want to share with you how to get started on this journey. So, uh, Whenever I talk and discuss beyond budgeting with, with people, finance people, executives, um, uh, others, there's one word that keeps coming up over and over again, and that is the word control. And the context is obvious. It's the fear of losing control. When I hear that, I often ask people, what do you mean with control? Uh, what are you so afraid of losing? And after people have said cost control, actually many go quiet. They struggle with defining what they are so afraid of losing. So I checked up uh, Oxford Dictionary. How would they define control? And they call it the power to influence or direct people's behavior or the course of events. And what, what does this mean in organizational terms, in business terms? Well, it basically means controlling people and controlling the future. And behind these two lies the two main assumptions 
behind traditional management. Number one, that you can't trust people. Number two, number two that the future is predictable and planable. And you all know that this is not true. These are illusions of control. Of course, you can manage people, but if people are managed in stupid ways, I mean, the, the, uh, they hopefully find a way around in order to get their job done. And when it comes to the future, the only thing we know is that we don't know. Talking about people and uh, trusting people, um, I've always traveled a lot. And um, the first thing I always check entering the hotel room at night is what kind of clothing hangers do they have? And uh, there are basically two types that meet us. And I guess we can all agree that the one at the bottom is a hassle to use compared to the one at the top with a hook. So how come some hotels offer us those stupid hangers at the bottom? I think we all know why it is about a few stolen hangers with a hook. And what was the response to punish everybody because somebody did something wrong? Actually, one of the problems with traditional management, which I will come back to. Wise people out there has definitely agreed with uh, what I've just have said. Uh, good old Peter Drucker uh, talking about people. Most of what we call management is about making it difficult for people to do their job. Uh, and I couldn't agree more. I mean, sometimes the problem is that we manage too much. And when it comes to the future, planning the future, another wise person, um, Russ Lakoff, he compared a lot of the planning, corporate planning he was observing in larger organizations. He compared it with a ritual rain dance. It has no effect on the weather, but those who engage in it think it does. And I can relate to what Mr. Akoff said here, because again, I have done a lot of dancing in my life through all the budget processes I've been heading up. I'm not sure it really had a big impact on the bottom line of the company even if the dancing might have been good. Okay, so much for wise uh, uh, people. Imagine an organization that 100 years ago invented a fantastic machine. It was state of the art and crucial for the success of this organization. And 50 years ago, this machine started to make some trouble. And today, this machine is completely broken. Kaput, it looked like this. This is not a true story, because in real life, hopefully, people would have done something 50 years ago, either try to fix that machine, or even better, try to invent a new machine, new, different, and better, because innovation is something we all love, right? Everybody wants to be leading edge, unique, right around the forefront, better than everybody else. But that enthusiasm for innovation seems to be limited to technology innovation into products and services. But there is also something called management innovation that we shall talk about today, exploring new ways of leading and managing. And management innovation, that isn't great. That is scary, right? Kicking out the budget, are you crazy? The consequence is that it's very crowded on the left-hand side. Everybody is into that kind of innovation in some form or shape. Management innovation is not yet the crowded place because it is scary. But this is actually good news for brave companies who dare to explore, embrace also this kind of innovation, because you can get just as much performance, competitive advantage out of management innovation as you can get from technology innovation. And as you probably know, there are many companies out there who openly state that we have no advantage whatsoever in what we um, produce, what we provide, we find it in the way we lead and manage. And I've got a few examples for you uh, in a minute. Um, so performance is a key word here. That is why we should go beyond budgeting because it is good for performance defined in the right way. And we can prove it. I will come back to that. But it is still called beyond budgeting. It has something to do with budgets and uh, also something to do with budgets and budget problems. So let me quickly share with you my budget problem list. Um, and then as I go through this list, you might reflect on are there any of these problems that you haven't experienced throughout your own career. And this is quite a long list. Um, this is a very time consuming process, making budgets, following up budgets. And by the way, when I talk about budgets, 
I'm talking more about company budgets, right? Profit and loss, balance sheet, cash flow. Uh, I do also include project budgets, but my main criticism is towards uh, uh, company budgets. So keep that in mind. Very time consuming. Assumptions quickly outdated. This is a serious problem. This process can stimulate what I would call unethical behaviors. The lowballing, the gaming, the sandbagging, the resource hoarding, the frenzy December spending, not the kind of behaviors we would like to see. It can create these illusions of control that we just talked about, right? Uh, of course, it might feel very comfortable to have next year described with a million details and decimals. But the only thing, again, we know is that we, we don't know. So if we don't have control, whatever that word means, maybe it's better to acknowledge it, accept it, and act accordingly. Not to think that we have it, to fool ourselves and act accordingly. Budgets force us to make decisions too early. We have to decide in the autumn, the year before, what we shall do next year, what it shall cost. And in large organizations, big organizations, too many of these decisions are taken too high up. Budgets can prevent us from doing stuff that we should have done, but we can't because it's not in the budget. But this also works the other way around. Maybe it sometimes can lead us to do things that we shouldn't have done, but it is in the budget and it is spend it or lose it. You know the game. And linked to this, I fully accept that the cost budget can be a very effective ceiling for cost. It works by all means, but that is just half the story because that ceiling is just as effective as a floor uh, because these budgets are spent, uh, tend to be spent for the reasons we just discussed. And to define um, this, um, uh, to define good performance, as hitting the budget numbers is a very narrow, mechanical, and sometimes quite an outdated way of describing good performance. We need a richer, broader, more intelligent performance language. And I wouldn't be surprised if most of you kind of nod um, uh, with maybe with some guilty smiles um, to when this list is coming up. If you do, you are in good company because I've been sharing this list of problems with hundreds of thousands of people. Um, around the world in the close to the 30 years I've been working with Beyond Budgeting. And almost everybody out there agrees, executives, managers, finance people. At the same time, most organizations continue doing this stuff that they do admit is not very smart, even if that is changing these days, as I will come back to. And I have a theory why, about why, but before that, I'd like to add on one more problem that not too many have on the list, I've called it conflicting purposes. I will come back to that problem. It's an interest, interesting problem because it's both a problem but it, and, and it represents a solution to many of these other problems. But I will explain why a bit later. But how come so many continue doing this stuff? And one reason might be that these problems are recognized, but they are regarded more as irritating itches um, and not symptoms of a deeper, bigger, systemic um, problem. Uh, but that is exactly what they are. And that problem is also a paradox. First of all, here we are looking at quite old management innovation. Do you know how old budgeting is? Actually, a hundred years old. And do you know who the inventor was back then? Well, you will have heard his name. Mr. James O. McKinsey, the founder of McKinsey Consulting. I never met the guy, but actually, I don't think he was an evil guy. I think he had the best of intentions back then. That was management innovation 100 years ago. And I'm sure it worked pretty well, maybe even 50 years ago, but no longer today because things have changed. Today, this way of managing, this way of thinking, this way of leading is doing exactly the opposite. It has become more of a barrier than a support for getting out the best possible performance. And that, my friends, I would call a pretty big uh, problem. Even, to, uh, even McKinsey today is starting to admit the, the, this, even if they won't take the word beyond budgeting in their mouth. Uh, a lot of their competitors, they do, fortunately. Anyway, uh, performance is the key word here. That is why we should go beyond budgeting. 
And I'd like to reflect on that word now in a slightly different setting, a very different setting than business and organizations, because some of you like uh, know that I like to use traffic as a metaphor here, because in traffic, we would also like to experience good performance. Um, and for me, that would be a safe and good flow, especially when there is crossing traffic. I simply hate traffic jams. And uh, by the way, I've never understood why it's called the rush hour. There is no rush at all. Those cars are standing dead still. But there is so much that I don't understand. Anyway, I think traffic authorities actually want the same. And this is something we often meet, whether it's crossing traffic. And this light has no sensors, okay? And to these two questions here, the one who is in control here, the one who manages should make decisions about when you can drive, when you have to stop, that is the person who programmed this light. And where would this person be as you sit there waiting? Well, somewhere else. And which information would this programming be based on? It will be based on some historical information, some forecast, but it would not be entirely fresh information as you sit there waiting. So this is a management model where the manager actually is absent and decisions are based on somewhat outdated information. But again, with the best of intentions, but fortunately, there is a much better solution with exactly the same purpose. We are talking about the roundabout. Very different question, answers to the same questions because here, we make decisions about when to drive and when to stop. And the information we use to make these decisions are fresh, real-time, here and now information. So very different answers. Could be interesting to compare a bit more these two ways of managing. So let's do that. And I've got a few leading questions for you. It's actually proven scientifically that the roundabout is not just more efficient, it's actually also safer and lifetime cycle cost is lower, proven. But we also know that the roundabout takes more competence from us. It's more difficult to drive in compared to the traffic light. And going back to our organizations, everything that we need to leave behind of traditional management is in so many ways so much easier than what we need to move towards. So what we need to move towards, it isn't easier, but it is so much better. And we can't go for what's easy because it's easy. We have to go for what is best for performance, even if it takes more from us, but in a positive way. Beyond budgeting changes work for everybody, but in a positive way. I don't think you will find a single soul in Equinor wanting to go back to the old days as one example. If there is a value set, a mindset among drivers waiting for that uh, green light, uh, which is about me first, I don't care about the rest, that mindset uh, is not a big problem typically in front of that light. But in the roundabout, me first don't care about the rest can actually be a big problem because here we are much more dependent on everybody involved um, but are sharing a positive uh, wish uh, of, of wanting this to flow well. Here we have to help each other. We have to interact with each other in a very different way than what is needed in front of that light. So it's not enough with fresh information and the authority to act on it. We also need a positive value set. Uh, I'm quite sensitive to, uh, to two, other, two, two other words, by the way, that are highly relevant um, uh, in this metaphor. Uh, the first one is, of course, trust in front of that light. We are not trusted in the roundabout we are. The other one is transparency. Not that important in front of the light. As long as we can see the color of the light, we can make our decision. In the roundabout, we need to see and understand the entire situation in order to make the right decision. Again, I'm quite sensitive to words, language uh, that we use in the important stuff we are discussing today. And there are some labels in the corporate lang language that I actually actively dislike. And one label is performance management. I dislike it for two reasons. First of all, I find it very negative. Aren't we basically telling people that if we don't manage your performance, there will be no performance? And also, I think there's quite a lot of illusion of control into that label. I mean, I think our ability to manage performance in today's business and people realities are quite limited compared to what many like to think, including executives, managers, finance people, and human resource people. Many of them love performance management, the big illusion. 
But if we talk about <clears throat> the traffic light, that is exactly what the traffic authorities are doing. <clears throat> they are managing performance very directly. In the roundabout, however, it is about something else because here it is more about creating conditions for great performance to take place. It is about enabling performance, not managing performance. And this, my friends, is much more than playing with words. These are two fundamentally different ways of addressing that important question. How do we get the best possible performance in our organization, right? That question is not new. That has been there all the time. It is the answers that has changed. And as you hopefully will have understood, uh, beyond budgeting is not about managing performance. It is about enabling uh, performance. The roundabout is a more self-regulating way of managing. And self-regulation is something organizations need today for at least two reasons. The first reason uh, is, um, well, they are both obvious. Um, but the first reason is about our business environment. The uh, level of volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity out there. Um, a lot more VUCA out there than when I started my budget and planning career in the early 80s. And if we take that VUCA level seriously, it must have implications for how we design our management model compared to if there's little or no VUCA out there. Very obvious. The other reality we need to reflect on is not external, it's internal. It has to do with people, employees asking ourselves what kind of employees do we generally believe that we have in the organization and i guess you're all familiar with douglas mcgregor and his theory x and theory y which is just as relevant today as when he introduced this back in 1960 and uh, again you, you know theory x this negative view that most uh, employees most people are a bunch of potential thieves and crooks and unless they're all managed tightly and kept on short leeches, they will all run away and do a lot of stupid things and spend money like drunken sailors. Uh, well, those were in my words. If you have read his book, he was a bit more polite and <laughs> academic, but I think that's what he meant. Then you have then theory why this much more positive view on people, a view that actually most employees, they, they want to be involved. They want to perform. They want to be listened to. They want to be treated as adults. And I often tell people that we don't need to agree on where our sympathy lies, even if we have a certain hope. But it should be very easy to agree that if we mainly believe in theory why our management model must look very different compared to if we mainly believe in theory X. That's, again, very obvious. So if we combine these two realities we need to reflect on, it could look like this, and you find traditional management then in this lower left -hand corner with a conscious or unconscious view that the world is still a predictable and planable place and that most people is on the exit. If we disagree with this, then this is not the place to be. Then we need to move up in that upper right -hand corner by addressing both leadership, people, in the horizontal dimension and our management processes in the vertical dimension. And what we need to get out of traditional management, I have used these words to describe. And I recall when I wrote these words many years ago, I said to myself, Bjarte, don't be too hard on traditional management. Don't overdo it. But again, I've been sharing these words all over the world with so many people. And um, it is a bit scary. I mean, so many of the looks I get when these words are coming up um, telling me that, or which I only can interpret in one way. I mean, so what isn't this the way it has to be? Well, maybe, maybe there was a time when this was the right thing to do. But as we talked about, things have changed. So what do we need to do? Um, a few headlines. We will make all of this more concrete. Uh, starting on the leadership side, we have to be less rules-based, more purpose, and more values-based. We are not saying no rules. We are saying less rules and more purpose and more values. There also has to be more autonomy, more empowerment, and transparency. Here comes that important word again. And in this context, transparency is actually very good news because transparency can be a very effective social control mechanism if it is applied with wisdom in the right way. Let me give you an example. 
Uh, you might have heard of Swede, uh, Swiss, uh, Swiss Roche, the pharmaceutical giant, who today are on a beyond budgeting journey, by the way. And uh, some years ago, they did a very interesting experiment around travel cost. In the pilot, they kicked out the travel budget, they kicked out travel rules and regulations, and replaced it with full transparency. So if you, with a few exceptions, everybody could see everything. If you travel to where did you fly, sleep, eat, cheap or expensive? Open for your colleagues to see and vice versa. And guess what happened with travel cost in that pilot? Came down through a very simple self-regulating control mechanism, right? But there is a but here. Uh, it is a very powerful mechanism. It must be applied with wisdom. And if it becomes naming and shaming, it doesn't work. That is why we should always position transparency more from a learning perspective than from a control perspective. How can we learn from each other if everything is secret? Last but not least, internal intrinsic motivation as opposed to external extrinsic motivation. And as we all know, the most common way to motivate people extrinsically in business and increasingly in the public sector today is unfortunately individual bonus. And I don't need to tell you what the research is telling us about this. Uh, I guess you know, but the beyond budgeting recommendation uh, is a very strong one about going for common bonus schemes instead of individual bonus uh, schemes. Now, a number of companies, um, when they talk about uh, people and leadership, write about it. They have the very best, I mean, they use very nice words and many of them have the very best intentions. But it doesn't help to have these theory Y leadership intentions if you have theory X management processes, right? Because that creates these poisonous gap, gaps between what is said and what is done. So if we are serious about these words, we have to make sure that they are reflected in our management processes, while at the same time making sure that our management processes are more VUCA robust. And a few headlines of what that could mean in practice. Um, first of all, the traditional detailed annual budgets, they simply have to go for the reasons uh, mentioned in that lower left-hand corner. More specifically, when we shall set targets and goals to the extent that we shall do that, that's an, also an interesting discussion. But if we have it, could we learn something from football? I have yet to meet the football team stating that the ambition for next season is 35 goals and 42 points. Right? They don't think like that. that those are budget goals. And they don't think like that. They think in terms of league tables, doing well against peers. And that thinking can sometimes be applied in organizations and business as well. When it comes to the rhythm, the cadence of these processes, why on earth shall everything circulate around an accounting cycle of typically um, January to December, the fiscal year? I mean, that doesn't make sense. We need to organize these processes where it's possible. Um, more on business-driven and event-driven uh, rhythms and less on calendar-driven rhythms. And last but not least, we cannot reduce performance evaluation to comparing two numbers, actual versus budget, and then, then conclude. We need a richer, broader performance language. And this was a high-level introduction to what Beyond Budgeting is about. It is about making organizations more adaptive and more human. It is as simple and as difficult as that. Now, what does this mean more concretely, more specifically in beyond budgeting terms? And I'd like to share with you on the next slide, the um, beyond budgeting model, the 12 principles, which also address both leadership and management processes. And um, you will find a number of similarities here with the Agile Manifesto, even if these principles actually were designed um, some years earlier, actually back in 1998, the first version. But the principles look like this. And let's start with that uh, tagline, which is important. Beyond budgeting redefines um, or changes how we define performance and how we deliver performance. This is about performance the right way. And again, you can see that we talk about leadership and management processes. And what we say about leadership um, here is um, 
it's not necessarily that unique. I mean, there are many other models and communities out there saying similar things, but very often they, these communities, these models have not reflected maybe enough, we would argue, about what kind of management processes are needed to activate these good leadership intentions. And that is key in beyond budgeting and addressing both. And we are very focused on creating coherence, the consistency between what we say on the left-hand side, what we do on the right-hand side, between what we preach and what we practice. A classical example of the opposite. It doesn't help to talk about principle four here, autonomy, about how fantastic employees we have on board, and we would be nothing without you, and we trust you so much, but not that much. Of course, we need detailed travel budgets, right? Principle nine or resource allocation, cost management. This is hypocrisy and people notice and the words on the left become hollow because the management processes have the opposite message. So this consistency is key in beyond budgeting. Uh, these are principles. This is not the recipe. So what this should mean in your organization depends on your organization, um, your business, your history, your culture, uh, and that's the way it should be. I don't like management recipes because in a management recipe, somebody has done all the thinking for you. So the only thing you have to do is to buy the books, hire the consultants, tick the boxes. I find that both dangerous and boring. Here you have to think for yourself. Some people dislike that. They want, they want the recipe. Well, then they have to go somewhere else. A number of companies are today on this journey in some form or shape. Um, some have come extremely far, extremely radical. Some have been more cautious and uh, many of them are somewhere in the middle. And um, this is the list as it looks today. Uh, this is a very living document because we keep adding companies here all the time. And I, I could have talked for hours, days about uh, fascinating management innovation taking place here. And you will know some of these cases, uh, but we don't have the time. So very quickly, two quick cases. Let's start in Norway. In the upper left-hand corner, you see a company called Miles. It's a Norwegian IT company, business in Norway, the Baltics, South Africa, and India. Miles have no budgets, no targets. If you work for Miles, you can buy whatever PC you want, as one example. Uh, as expensive as you want, replace it as often as you want. No travel budgets, no, no, no um, PC budgets. You can attend whatever conference uh, you want as often as you want, wherever in the world, no travel budgets, no training budgets. But it's not an anarchy. When you have bought that PC, when you have returned from that training, you have to post on the internet what you did and the cost of it. So transparency is their only control mechanism beyond the fact that they are very conscious in the recruitment process about what kind of people they employ. The pioneer in Beyond Budgeting is a very different company. It's a bank, uh, Handelsbanken, you see them at the top here in the middle. It's a Swedish bank with a presence in Northern Europe, um, around 10,000 employees, 700 branches, quite big in the UK, by the way. Very fascinating bank for many reasons. One reason is that they have no budgets, no targets, no individual bonus, but it doesn't stop here. They have been doing this since 1970 and it doesn't stop here because they have been performing better than the average of its competitors every single year since 1972. Right? Not just on um, financial performance, but also if you look at um, customer satisfaction, since, uh, since that was, uh, uh, since um, uh, banks started to measure that more, more kind of uh, formally uh, many years later, they have been crushing their competitors and employee engagement sky high. Very, very interesting um, uh, company. And uh, the guy behind it all, uh, this was the CEO uh, back then, 1970. This is some of the things he said about the, the budget, which I find quite interesting. But he was also very clear that kicking off the budget was just one of many things um, needed in order to become the company they became. So uh, it was uh, it was necessary, but not, not uh, um, uh, sufficient. So what is key is this coherence in everything they do 
uh, in behind not not setting targets and and how they think about performance, how they evaluate performance, how they reward performance. No individual bonus, just a common bonus scheme, uh, driven by how is the bank doing versus other banks. You don't get the bad bonus every year. You get it when you retire or when you leave the bank. There should be nothing that smells of short term. Do this and get that. Now. Does this stuff work? I've shared with you a few uh, kind of anecdotes. Well, Hundreds Marketing is not an anecdote because this, this, their performance has been thoroughly documented. And we, we can do the same with a number of, of companies here. But um, some executives, they won't listen to what we say, but they will listen to what the big consulting companies are saying. And lately, almost all the big consulting companies have become interested in beyond budgeting because their clients are asking for it. And we have had, we are not naive. We've had long discussions. Uh, what should our response be? And we have actually concluded that, that yes, we want to work with these companies, uh, even if we are coming from different places, because we would rather help these companies and especially their clients succeed than stand on the outside and watch them fail and give Beyond Budgeting a bad name. And what has happened recently is that two of these um, companies have done surveys um, among clients and others about uh, how, do the, how do these perceive beyond budgeting and does it work? And if we start with Boston Consulting Group, BCG, um, they asked, what kind of benefits are you practitioners seeing? And um, these are what they came up with. And you can see that the most kind of uh, the biggest impact is a very direct uh, positive impact on the financial numbers and increase in in sales but also mother, many other um, more indirect effects uh, on behavior and so on that also would positively benefit the bottom line another consulting company um, bain and company had a slightly different angle they have defined a peer group of what they call leading companies in financial planning. And they looked at these leading companies and they looked at how, how do these leading companies apply the beyond budgeting principles compared to the rest. And this is what they came up with. And the leading companies are here in dark blue. And again, quite a compelling picture and quite a strong difference between these two uh, groups of, of, uh, of companies. Now, then um, some executives, after having seen that, they say that, well, this sounds interesting, but how can I get started? They might find the 12 beyond budgeting principles a bit scary, a bit big, um, especially many finance people would do that. If that is the case, we have some good news. We have a very practical, tested, logical, simple way of getting started that we've applied with the majority of these companies that we just looked at uh, to help them get started. And it goes back to asking, um, we asked these companies to ask themselves a very simple question. Why do you budget? And most companies would, would come up with three different reasons for why they make budgets. The first reason would be that uh, we use budgets to set financial targets, sales targets, production targets. So target setting would be one purpose. The second purpose that typically come up with is forecasting. We use the budget to help us to understand what might lie ahead next year in terms of profit and loss, cash flow. And the third purpose of this company budget is resource allocation, handing out bags of money to the organization both on operational costs and on investments. And it might seem very efficient to solve three purposes in one process and one set of numbers, just like a financial kinder egg. But that's also the problem. Because what happens when we move into a budget process um, and upstairs finances, may, let's assume they want to understand next year's profit and loss. And they start by asking people responsible on the revenue sales side, what are your best numbers for next year? But everybody knows that what I'm sending upstairs will come back to me as a target for next year, maybe with a bonus attached. And trust me, that insight will do something to the level of numbers submitted. Moving to the cost side, uh, operational cost, investments, the same people, other people are asked, what are your best numbers for next year? But everybody knows that this is my only shot at getting access to resources for next year. 
right? And maybe some remember that 20% cut from last year. And that insight and that memory might also do something to the level of numbers uh, submitted. And this is a problem, not just because it destroys the quality of numbers, but also because it stimulates this behavior that is at least borderline unethical. At the same time, I'm not blaming anyone for behaving like this. They are just responding to the system we have designed for them to operate in. So if we want to change behaviors, it is not about fixing people. It is, as you know, about changing systems. And that is what Beyond Budgeting is about as well. So the good news here is that there is a very simple solution. We say that, well, if you, we, we, we should, if we shall do these things, we shall do them in three separate processes because these are different things. A target is an aspiration. It's what we want to happen. While a forecast is an expectation. It's what we think will happen. Whether we like what we see or not, brutally on honest, the expected outcome. And resource allocation, that is about the optimization of what is often scarce resources, namely people and money. And because we have separated, we can now allow targets to be more ambitious than forecast, which they typically should be. But even more importantly, that separation opens up for great improvement discussions. How can we now do each of these in much better ways? Like, for instance, target setting, where we recommend where possible, uh, where it makes sense, think football, think in relative terms. Um, some companies go further and say that we don't need targets. We just heard about two companies who operate very successfully without targets. Then we can work on getting the politics and the gaming out of the forecasting so that we can trust the numbers. So here, that forecast is not a bid into a target negotiation. It's not a promise. It's not a bid for money. It's just the forecast. We, uh, we, because we've got different processes for those two other purposes. And we don't need a million details here. This is forecasting is not accounting. And last but not least, how can we define more intelligent and effective ways of managing costs than what Mr. McKinsey could offer us 100 years ago? And last but not least, how can we then organize uh, each of these? And by the way, here is a typo, excuse me. That should read more event-driven and less calendar-driven. Uh, I'm not sure that is, that is correct when I, when I share the slides with you. So how can we organize all of these on a more event-driven and less calendar-driven rhythm? And since we now have limited time, I've decided to use, um, uh, only spend a little bit more time on the last one on resource allocation, um, managing costs, but that's also where most of the question, questions come. And uh, here, our recommendations kind of force into two categories, um, treating projects and investments on one hand, operating cost on the other hand. And let's start with, with projects, investments. And um, let me give an example from Equinor. And um, again, since this company is in the energy business, there's a lot of kind of steel and, and, and concrete into projects here. Um, but the company has no traditional annual investment budget. The company invests between 10 and 15 billion US dollars a year. There's no traditional investment budget, but you sit in the autumn the year before and decide everything, exactly how much to invest, exactly split on these projects, and then you hand out these bags of money. That's not the process. Instead, there is a more dynamic process based on a simple principle. The bank is always open. The line can always forward the project for approval at any time. At any time. How, whether you get a yes or no depends on two things. How good is your project against the criteria that the company has? Financial, non-financial, strategic. And second question, can we afford it? Do we have the capacity as things look today? And where is that information coming from unbiased uh, uh, dynamic forecasting or forecasts? So it's not that difficult on projects. Uh, when moving to operating costs, a bit more challenging, um, but we have ways of, of um, um, uh, uh, recommendations here and well. And, Imagine an organization that needs fuel in order to produce. 
And what would be the best way for this organization to be supplied with fuel? Would it be the budget way, as illustrated here, that you receive a fixed number of fuel cans once a year in January? Or would it be access to a pipeline um, of fuel where you can consume more uh, depending on or, or less depending on how much you produce? And that, my friends, that was meant to be a leading question. Of course, the latter solution is much, much better. Making this more specific, um, in Beyond Budgeting, we say that before we can start to talk about alternative tools, we need to start about mindsets um, that uh, we need to change. And that is very much about asking different questions when we shall spend money. The classical budget question, when you shall make do something that costs money, is do I have a budget for this? And you, if you have, it's okay. And if you don't have, it's not okay. A bit simplified. We would like to hear other questions instead. Is this really necessary? What's good enough? How much value is this creating? And is this within my execution framework? And these are questions we should ask all the time on every cent, every penny we are spending, right? And not just kind of in November and December in the budget year when the budget bag is almost empty. Uh, in some companies, this kind of mindset compared with the transparency is enough. Big companies like Equinor and others, uh, they require more. And we have a menu that they can pick for, from if they need more. And on this menu, we want to leave the detailed annual budget on the left. Uh, we need something that more has more empowerment, more autonomy. Here is one alternative. There is a number in the range of 1,000, 1 million, 10 million. Uh, within that, full autonomy to... Um, to do the right thing. This is more of a guardrail. We call it a burn rate guiding. But we can move from absolute constraints to relative constraints. There might be input, uh, sorry, relative uh, um, uh, cost targets. You can spend more if you produce more and vice versa. There can be even more self-regulating relative targets like um, unit cost versus peers, where there's no predefined number. If you have internal profit centers with a bottom line target, that's also a way of managing cost. These guys cannot run away and spend money like crazy, but it might be okay to spend more if what you spend is called good cost because they create value. It's the bad cost we want to get rid of. And last but not least, nothing at all. Nothing at all. No budget, no target, no constraints. You only monitor actual cost and you intervene, you monitor through control charts or moving averages and you intervene if needed. The further to the right we are here, the more trust we are showing. And the more trust you show in an organization, um, the higher the likelihood it, it, there is that it will be abused. In Equinor, it has happened, it will happen again. That is not the issue. The issue is how we respond. And back to the clothing hangers example, the right response is not to put everybody in jail and go back to traditional cost budgeting. It is to deal firmly with those who abuse trust and let it have the necessary consequences. This is not about being soft and evasive. It is not, not putting everybody in jail because somebody did something wrong. The further to the right you are, the stronger you have to be, be on values and direction. Are you weak on that? You have to be a bit careful. Two other guardrails that are more generic and can be uh, used in any of these alternatives. There might be decision authorities. How big individual decisions can a manager make before you have got to go one level up? And spending guidelines. Again, an example from Equinor uh, in Europe. Um, people fly coach. Um, if it's intercontinental, you can fly business. It has nothing to do with travel budgets. All right, so that is basically my story. Um, there was a few books uh, mentioned. This is my previous book, Implementing Beyond Budgeting, which has more of everything. Um, a lot of stuff that we didn't talk about uh, today, the Borealis case, what we did in that company in the mid uh, 90s. That was my first possibility to be involved in kicking out. There was a chapter about Beyond Budgeting and Agile and much more about implementation advice. And when it comes to translations, there's actually a, a German version out uh, uh, just a few months ago. And as Ryan mentioned, um, this one is just out. It is a shorter book. It is aimed at uh, uh, people with limited time to read. I think you know who I uh, who I mean. Um, 
And uh, I'm very proud that Gary Hamill, as you probably know, um, wrote the foreword. So with that, I'm, I'm, I'm going to so... stop sharing. And I look forward to hearing your questions and comments. Thank uh, you. Could you. Could you please... Sorry? Could you please show us yeah previous slide if it's possible? Uh, previous slides. Okay. I can. Okay, I just uh, want to see what the main uh oops. That's the yeah, one? yeah, this one. Yeah, yeah. So this so, came out the uh, uh, first edition back in 2008 actually, and a heavily revised version back in 2016. Um, yeah, is that okay? Yeah, yes, thank you, sure. Very good. And by the way, uh, these are my coordinates, if anybody wants to contact me later on. Um, this is my mail address, and if you want to follow me on Twitter and LinkedIn, highly appreciated. This is the only stuff I write about. I, there's no cats and dogs and grandchildren, I promise. Um, and check out, also out the Beyond Budgeting Roundtable website. It is in a beta version, but uh, it's going to be expanded mm -hmm. quite soon. So, questions, comments? Great. Thanks, Beata. So there's yeah lots of questions in the chat. Um, but uh, since you mentioned uh, that the book is uh, for a particular audience, uh, maybe I'll start with the first question from Jim, which is... Uh, you know, who is the best audience in a typical organization for, for this topic in, in general? Is it middle middle layers, uh, C-suite? Like, where do, where do you start? Well, I think that's two different questions. Of course, the best ideal audience is always the executives. But uh, if if that is difficult, that may, doesn't mean that you should give up. Um, we've seen examples where they started in finance, uh, even examples where it started in human resources. And um, either one of them or the two together, which is the best actually convinced the executive board that to, to start out. Um, but doing this in the end without finance or uh, executives or board would, of course, be, be difficult. But, um, uh, yeah. Cool. Thanks. Um, so, yeah, going a bit further up in the messages. So uh, Daryl was asking about... Uh, financial budget rhythms and whether this, you know, beyond budgeting is, can it be unlinked from a regulatory uh, reporting and, and such like? Oh, that's a good question. I think we need to distinguish between accounting and statutory accounting, looking at the past. And beyond budgeting companies, they don't change that much in how they report historical data to the market because that is regulated, heavily regulated. This is about all the good stuff that you internally in order for those burden numbers to be as good as possible. So Equinor still has, it's a listed company listed in, in the US and Norway, still do quarterly reporting um, to the market as everybody else. Uh, what I don't do is um, to give all that detailed guiding that a lot of uh, other companies, listed companies are doing. Mm -hmm. And are there any accounting software systems that align with beyond budgeting specifically? I mean, they, we are system agnostic uh, and your system will never be the barrier for doing this because all the barriers will be uh, between your ears. But um, system can help you in two ways, uh, create one version of the truth and create transparency. But never let the systems be kind of the the uh, the, um, the stumbling block here. It's never a showstopper. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then J Jim was saying he sees a lot less uh, American companies there than European. Is is that just because that's most of your audience personally, or is well, there something uh, about cultural differences here? I'm writing about this in my book, and um, I, I've got a few theories. Of course, one, a lot of the other very successful stuff out there, like uh, like budgets, like balance scorecards, like OKRs, it was actually invented in the U.S., Beyond budgeting was not. So maybe it's easier to embrace stuff from your own country than, than stuff born other places. But of course, there are cultural is issues playing out here. There are issues with the, for instance, the Nordic culture that makes this uh, easier. But again, there are some amazing uh, US uh, cases um, that we all know that are, um, even if they wouldn't call themselves beyond budgeting, they are that in, 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 in so many ways. Mm -hmm. 
Cool. And then, uh, Ray, you had a couple of questions. I don't know if you want to un unmute yourself. It's uh, yours are more on the human side, so they're harder for me to decode. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't think I don't think there's many people in this session who wouldn't agree in the logic of, of this. And, and I, but I, I, I don't pretend to make the same meaning as everybody else. But I am fascinated. And it is it does bring in the US question. I am fascinated um, on the human side of it because there the seems to me a dimension of vertical development, which has been touched on only in the mention of the word mindset. So, so my question would would on my, so playing into that, I'm thinking all these organisations who aren't changing, or all this change that hasn't happened in management over all these decades. If we then think let's go to beyond budgeting, or or, or we we want to work with people who do that, they have to start seeing things differently where they are. They have to start connecting differently. They have to be more authentic about who they are in that space. And, and and this is a whole dimension that we just we we covered the details of what the structure and things are, but not that. Oh, it's a very good question, and and uh, the the um, uh, you know the, the the challenging thing with beyond budgeting is not to change what we do because there's no rocket science. The the the, the challenge is to change how we think. For instance, challenging those two assumptions that um, the world is predictable and planable, and um, and that you can't trust people. So without a change behind on those two, all of this will be very difficult. But again, you know, processes drive mindset and culture. So that's why we recommend uh, start out with that. Start out simple with that. Um, if if you can't get executives to buy into the big stuff and the kind of the full the full uh, the full monte of all of this, um, um, then start out with that budget separation. It is. Um, it is simple, it's logic. I've yet to meet an executive who don't get it. But once you have done that, once you get these people to reflect on, well, how, how, what kind of targets do we need to get that really ignites people, that really gets the best possible performance? How do we get the gaming and the kind of um, suboptimal behaviors after the forecasting? How can we uh, make sure that we spend money in the best possible um, effective way? then you are getting into this issue. You have, then you are forced to think about what target setting, what really motivates people. Resource allocation. If we say we trust people, how, how can we need detailed travel budgets? So we have seen over and over again that that kind of not very scary separation of budget purposes is a trigger for bigger and bigger leadership and behavior uh, questions, right? So it is a way to get started if that initial leadership uh, discussion is a bit difficult. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Cool. And um, we're slowly running, out, quickly running out of time. But uh, maybe one one last one uh, from David, who uh, really wanted to uh, get onto this uh, call. So uh, anything about government bodies or public sector organisations that have adopted the principles, Beata? Yes, we get that question a lot and stuff is starting to happen. Let me give you, a, it was a case I didn't mention, but the Norwegian Social Securities Labour um, Organization is a huge organization. They have 12 customer contact centers across Norway. In 2020, they did a very interesting experiment. Um, they uh, uh, told two of these centers, you can operate uh, without any cost budgets at all. So that kind of right hand alternative on my menu, uh, only monitoring and cost. Uh, the message to these, these teams was spend what is needed to do a good job, but not more. And when 2020 was over, then they could look at the results. And this was, of course, the first, first year of the pandemic. So all these units had lower external costs, but none had bigger, higher cost reductions than the two pilots, minus 50% in both. So the year after 2021, they expanded this to six of 12 centers. And these days, all 12 are running without cost budgets and it works wonderfully. Cool. And then last one, because he's waving his hand is Javier, uh, did you have something? Yeah. Yeah, no, we can't hear you. Well, I can read your question in the meantime. You said you have a comment and question about the discussion of theory X, Y, but I guess, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we hear you now, yeah. Okay, just quickly, because I know we're running out of time. So 
if you look at your matrix that you have between processes and leadership, mm -hmm. I I think there's a lot of detail, right? But but I think a, a, a useful distinction between the left and the right is who's allowed to think, who has permission to think, right? Mm -hmm. On the left side, even on the dynamic scenario, which a lot of companies can mm -hmm. be quicker at doing the same things, the yes, faster or, or, or more in smaller batches, but it's still the same people are, are mm -hmm. making the decisions, right? Mm -hmm. On the other side, you have you you're tapping into the power, the, the the potential of the whole organization. Absolutely. And, and, it's, it's... and the reason I think that's important is because that doesn't require you to understand every quadrant or or understand mm -hmm. what's on the upper right. It just tells you you you're leaving potential on the table. You're overburdening your people. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a better way, right? And the other thing was like exactly what somebody else said. You know about maybe the Scandinavian culture. You know, I, I mean, I feel like it's more of a theory why culture, <laughs> just oh, built yeah. in. And you had examples of that with consulting since like Crisp, with with Spotify, yes, with yes. with your work, you know, for like since 10, 15 years ago, right? So that's why I think that you kind of have to assume that companies that are on the left side, they 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 have to learn by doing, but they have to have some sort of of reason to do it. And that's why I think this kind of idea about your 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 overburdening your people, the decision makers are not getting good information. And making bad decisions and and you're not taking advantage of your whole human potential, it, it might be a good way to to kind of persuade people to move in that direction. Yeah, but 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 again, I mean, if you're serious about um, wanting more people involved in the thinking, then you need to change your management processes, right? Yes. So, yes. but I really like that that way of phrasing it. So I I, I might borrow that one if you don't want it. <laughs> so. I know we are running out of time, but if somebody wants to hang on to something I didn't talk much about, which goes back to the, the title of the session, um, The Elephant in the Room, and it goes back to uh, Agile and Beyond Budgeting. And um, um, the, you know, and what I will say now is no criticism of Agile at all. I'm a big fan. Um, I've been involved in this community since before the Agile Manifesto, but um, um, <laughs> I think some of the reasons for the early success of Agile in big companies was um, what executives observed in those pioneer years. They observed better projects, better outcomes, more engaged employees, and who can be against that? Great work. Keep up the good work. I love Agile. Wonderful. Then Agile started to scale. And one day it had implications for executive beliefs and behaviors, and it wasn't that fun anymore. That's one reason why scaling Agile is difficult. The other reason is that Agile was not designed originally as a way to run an organization, right? It was designed for to improve software development and how teams work, and it did wonders. But when you scale Agile, these holes in Agile become visible, right? All the stuff on the right-hand side, target setting, uh, forecasting, resource allocation, performance evaluation, rewards. Um, Agile is almost blank on a lot of that stuff. So that is why Agile and Beyond Budgeting together is such a wonderful uh, fit. And the last thing I think, reason why I think uh, we sometimes scale, struggle with scaling Agile has to do with language, right? For an executives who don't play rugby or are unfamiliar, uh, unfamiliar with, 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 with Agile, then, and Scrum might sound like a, a skin disease, or Sprint might sound like running faster, or kind of Slack is about laziness, or continuous delivery is about 24-7, right? So you need a language that these guys can relate to. We provide that language in Beyond Budgeting. They might still kind of challenge us, but they do understand what we are talking about. So again, that is why it's so important that we join forces, come together. That makes us so much uh, uh, stronger. Excellent, thank you. Yeah, and yeah, we can officially end this. And thanks so much, uh, Beata. Uh, and yeah, if you want to stay on for a few minutes, we oh, I'm, sure, yeah. I'm sure a few of us will be very happy for you too. But um, thanks for uh, for those who can't stay on. Yeah, thanks for joining us and. Um, We'll see you around. So Thank yeah, you so much, uh, Ryan and Gus. <laughs> Brilliant session. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, and there's some great comments in the uh, chat. So thank you. Um, on that note, uh, Beata, then um, uh, for those who are uh, in the agile world, there's there's a, a fad at the moment around OKRs. I wonder if you could say something about 
that what you're seeing, if anything, um, uh, generally as a concept and also how it's being applied in, um, in organizations? Um, Actually, writing about this in in my in my uh, latest book, and um, uh, again, what I want to say now is not kind of criticism of uh, OKRs. Uh, there are many similarities between the two concepts. Um, uh, the the I mean the, the the fact that you we that you kind of translate through organization uh, instead of cascading. Um, that um, uh, you have a, a cadence which is trying to break out of the calendar uh, cycle, even if I do hesitate on this uh, quarterly focus, because what's so magical with the quarter? Uh, so we would re recommend more an event than business-driven rhythm instead of a predefined uh, quarterly uh, cycle. Uh, no link to individual bonus, also extremely important. But then I have some hesitations, and, and there seems to be an assumption that... Uh, um everything can be measured um which i would challenge um and also an assumption that everything should be target set which uh, i would challenge um there is a lot of stuff that um, shouldn't have target or you can't set targets or it doesn't make sense um and also i think my i think my biggest concern about okrs is boom and bust because even if the, con the concept has been around for a long time you know, it exploded after John Dorr's book. And uh, now it's on everybody's lips. Uh, I'm not convinced that we will talk as much about OKRs in 10 years' time than what we do um, today. And finally, again, also OKRs was not designed as a way to run an entire organization. There's a lot of things that OKRs doesn't address. And that's not a criticism. But it's an example of a lot of concepts and models are addressing part of a management model. Uh, beyond budgeting is tr trying to address the totality, not just of the management processes, but also on the leadership side. Mm. So that's my reflection. And this is my what I elaborate more on in, in, um, in the book. That's great. Thanks. Anything else from anyone before we close up? Feel free to uh, yeah, I would like to ask you guys, um, like your opinion and Bjarte uh, as well for for sure. Thanks for the presentation. So my question: How should we deal with uh, some, um, uh, you know, when you try to make an agile transformation, you try to change cultural aspect, you try to. Uh, make it on the same way for the entire organization. Uh, there are some, uh, you know, um, some blockers. They and group group blockers. They don't want to make it happen, so they try to push you away from transformation. And for example, I had such experience when I did a great job of agile coaching. Uh, we made a great transformation shift, but but then we have like one month uh, uh, time uh, of, uh, you know, stopping because of budgeting and contracting stuff of Agile transformation. And when we are back to the uh, client, uh, we faced with this issue of group blockers. So in your opinion, how it could be resolved uh, based on uh, those inputs? Well, if, if I could start, then, I mean, what you're describing is is not a total agile transformation because, I mean, obviously, if those processes are run like you described, there's a lot of things out of scope um, and, and you will never succeed with, with a true agile transformation. Um, and, and again, the, the, and the way to, to get to these people is to I mean, help them understand the these serious and systemic problems with the stuff they are doing because very well i mean they are not aware of it they they are not necessarily evil people all of them but they are not well informed very often about the dysfunctionality of what seems like very efficient and 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 kind of uh, smooth processes from a corporate point of view so you need to help them here and um, uh, the good news these days is that we get this increasing list of companies doing this so it gets easier and easier to point to competitors doing this. 
And uh, I'm a bit cynical. I mean, it's not the ideal kind of trigger for transformation that competition is doing this, but um, if that is what's needed, then, then um, yeah. So, um, but um, yeah, you need to help these guys to understand, um, again, the problems and help them with an easy way of get started, which I just talked about, the separation of the budget purposes, which they will understand. That would be my answer, but maybe so other people have more to add. So. When you talk about competition, um, and I, I've put a link to one or two bits in the, the chat, I think looking at sort of the, the group of companies now, kind of put aside what you think of Elon Musk as an individual. I know people have very strong opinions about him. Um, but particularly if you look at the stuff that Joe Justice, um, who worked at Tesla, he's from Wikispeed, um, you may have come across him, uh, how he describes how those companies are run. It's so in line and it, it's beyond kind of what we think of as, as agile transformations. They don't have budget. They do a lot of, based on my understanding, what you're talking about, which is you're know, looking at those kind of KPIs. You know, you spend as much as you need to spend to get the right result. They don't have middle management layer. You know, so you don't you're not waiting for humans to make decisions. Uh, if you you might be employed for one particular job, but if there's something else more important that needs doing, you know, you may have been employed to, you know, screw the wheels on, but if you need to help build a bit of the factory, that's what you do. You organize and continuously reorganize every day, every hour, every minute around what is the next most important problem to be solving. And the budget just flows with that. And I think in terms of seeing competition proving that that way of operating your business is it gets better results i think we're seeing that in real time now compared to you know legacy auto manufacturers yeah, yeah. no it's i mean um, uh, joe and me we, we, we've been in touch uh, because we've been speaking at many of the same conferences so it is a fascinating story um and uh, i really hope it's true uh the the i mean i think what joe is telling is very fascinating but it would be useful to have kind of more proof and more stories coming out beyond uh, what he has been sharing. Um, and uh, there are some people, uh, and not necessarily agreeing, saying that Joe was there for such a short period that these, this is not necessarily the full story. Um, um, I, I'm not saying that, and, and I really wish it is, but um, uh, but I do find it hard, hard to kind of combine with some of uh, Musk's behaviors, I have to say. Uh, but that's a different story. But... Um, uh, I would love it to be to to be to be true. And, uh, but uh, I think whether you, uh, I think just looking at the results, you know, if you look at kind of what Sandy Monroe Monroe Live, you know, they talk about Tesla innovating at the speed of thought. You know, that how how fast they can make changes, the way their factories are designed. These are things which are very physical evidence of Absolutely. they do things differently whether they do everything as well as what joe talks about yeah. that's a different yeah. question but i fully agree there, there is something to this absolutely which is yeah. fascinating absolutely yeah. so um yeah mm. there was okay. a hand there, I think. maybe we'll end with javier i i really went so if anybody else wants to go <laughs> but um go for it I, my my question is that uh you know when you're trying to when you do your, your pitch right you, you try to to uncover a cognitive dissonance between what people are doing and what they would like to to achieve and what they what they think things should be like right like when you say about you know you're 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 not getting the results you want all the problems you put in the in the budgeting problems area and then they say okay you're right and then you know most of the time people know what the problems are right but then they ask you where are your case studies right where has this work and and what I find that use is useful and and a very silly example it's story points versus throughput based estimation, right? Is that sometimes you can do things in parallel. Sometimes you can just kind of say, keep doing what you're doing, try this on the side. It's, it's very cheap to do and then see what's better, right? Compare how many of your things in your principles, how, how much of what you, you prescribe is actually doable in that way? It doesn't require a, a wholesale replacement of practices. Yeah. Well, first of all, and, and I, I haven't been very specific on that, but beyond budgeting can be everything from an improvement of finance processes to a true um, corporate transformation and anything in between. Right, So you have that kind of um, kind of sliding scale. Um, and um, 
the the other thing, um, and oh, no, no, I, I lost your question. Now. I have my answer on my lips. No, no, so, my, so, my question was. Yeah, can, can yeah you... no, in parallel, yes, and and uh, you know, it, it's what we do see often is um, pilots. Uh, that uh, especially larger companies are alone from pilots, which is a, can be a great way of getting started. Uh, doing this in parallel in the same organization, I would argue, is very difficult. You can't operate with traditional cost budgeting and dynamic resource allocation at the same time. It, it wouldn't work. So right. here you have to you have to make a choice. But if you want to be cautious, then pilot. And yeah. Uh, so, yeah. For instance, with roadmaps, you can do a parallel traditional uh, feature and, and date-based roadmap, and you can do an outcome-oriented roadmap, uh, which, sh which shows which of your features are working towards whatever uh, business goal you have. So maybe uh, my, my, my struggle is that people need to believe that change is possible, right? And that, that's, I think, that's the number one obstacle. And, and I was just wondering, what have you been deal dealing with? Pilots are great, but, but they, you can't always... It's like it's like studies with rats, right? <laughs> People say that's not gonna work in humans, right? Yeah. Uh, it's it's hard to to get there, you know. Yeah. Or like things like positive deviance, for instance, also yeah. really really useful. Yeah. But uh, but as I said, I mean the the fact that this list of um, companies on the journey keeps kind of growing so fast is is really helping us these days. And yeah. again, the big consulting companies, um, most of them, um, I'm saying that this is good stuff. Um, that uh, is also um, helping. So there is a momentum these days, which is really fascinating. At the same time, some people have told us that how come this takes so long? I mean, you, th that those principles, the first version formulated back in 1998, that's a long time ago, 25 years. Um, how come it takes a long time? You know, I... I'm not worried at all. I'd rather see something that is growing steadily, sustainably, uh, year by year, than anything that could risk becoming a boom and bust. And we just talked about OKRs. I think the risk is there. So I think for me, the kind of direction here, steady growth is uh, is is the most important one. And and again, the the big consulting companies coming on board was a kind of another step on that uh, uh, quite sustainable uh, journey. Great. Right. Awesome. Thank you for your good reflections. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Beata.